Rob Baxter this week hit out at World Rugby Law Changes, stating, We need to stop changing the laws. The game was fine three or four years ago, and we didn't need to change it then. 90% of what we do in the law changes is to redo things that have been created by other law changes. It is madness. And this isn't the first time that uh, Rob Baxter has spoken up about this. He did it a couple of years ago too when, you know, the previous raft of changes were coming in. He definitely wants stability. He wants teams to be able to settle down and just make things easier to understand for the players, for the supporters and for the management themselves. But what do you think? I mean, I agree up to a point, but I'm happy to see law trials uh, to sort of try and work out where the game can be improved. And I also think there are various things that just need to be sorted out, like the DuPont loophole and speeding up play from, from Caterpillar rucks. Uh, and World Rugby has come up with a five-phase plan, and I went through the first couple of phases last week. Uh, you can check out my thoughts in that video up there, but ultimately the sort of headline from that is the speed up of play from rucks with the use it call being called more quickly, which we've seen in effect already and I think has been really valuable. Luke Pierce doing a great job of that so far. He really epitomises the way I think referees should be refereeing. Just trying to hurry things along a little bit, not allow the dead time in the game where you know supporters can get a little bit bored, players can recover, we want fatigue in the game and, and just pushing it along in these tiny little ways I think really helps that. But... Let's look at the, uh, the third phase in a little bit of detail now uh, and see if there's any sort of sense to what they're trying to do here. Now, the third phase is closed law trials. So this means, you know, sort of an extended trial in one competition uh, to see what the effects are. And the first one is the expansion of the shot clock from scrum and lineouts and reduced kicking time. Now, I think scrum and lineouts, that should be down to the referee to manage. The best referees do this. Again, I'm going to talk about Luke Pierce because he does it consistently. Just keeps people moving along and the players respect that and, and respond to him. Reduced kicking time, currently 60 seconds for a penalty after it's been nominated and 90 seconds after a try has been scored. I'd be happy to see that reduced to 45 seconds and maybe a minute 15. I, you know, I think potentially there is too much time there for kickers and shortening it wouldn't harm anything. But let's see what the law trial says. The next one is the one that's got the most complex outcomes, probably. And that is the ability to mark the ball inside the 22 metre line from a restart. And World Rugby say this promotes attacking options. Now, I guess, you know, if you kick the ball inside the 22 and it gets marked, what you then don't get the option is, is to put pressure on that kicker. So chances are that kicker is going to go way back down, certainly into your half of the pitch, which is not what you want from a restart. If... You then kick the ball short, somewhere between the 10 metre line and the 22. You're essentially looking to build pressure, maybe get the ball back if you're kicking on the shorter end of that. So I could see how that would potentially add a bit more excitement to the game. But I'll question whether this is even necessary because a couple of years ago, maybe, there were teams just kicking to the best ball carrier, one ruck, kick, and then we're into the, you know, the box kick tennis, basically. But in this year's Six Nations, we saw a lot of... Uh, innovation in kickoffs. We saw a lot of short kickoffs at different times in the game as well, not just late when teams needed to score. There was a lot of, of different options taken. So maybe this is an example of where we don't need to change the laws. We just need to let things evolve on their own and you know it will it will change on its own. So again, happy to see it trialed, but I'm not sure it's actually needed, this one. The next one is the ball must be played after the mall has been stopped once, not twice. Now, uh, this is a slight depowering of the mall, as far as I'm concerned. And people say in the game at the moment it's too powerful. And Rob Baxter, who we talked about at the start, said it's not too powerful. You just need to put in the same number of players or more to stop it going forwards uh, and become better at defending the mall or just apply it. Um, so I'm not a fan of this one uh, off the bat. You know, I think the mall is important. I think it's as important as the scrum is in creating space in the rest of the field. So, again, happy to see a trial, but, I, you know, I don't want to see the mall depowered uh, too much because that changes the main sort of, just the way the game is played. So, on to the next one. And this is, and this is an example of where World Rugby used some quite woolly language. And I wonder if they're deliberately 
putting things out there which are a bit woolly and then they go and monitor what people are saying about them to try and figure out exactly how they need to, to word these things. So this one is protection of the nine at the base of the scrum, rock and at the mall following successful trials in Major League Rugby in the USA and in elite and community competitions in New Zealand. So I don't know what, exactly what those trials were, so it's hard to say. But the one place where I think there is an opportunity, opportunity here to improve the game is is when if a player's legally bound inside a, a rock or a mall and they happen to be stood right next to the, the opposition scrum half as he's picking the ball up. Current, uh, as the current laws say that as soon as that ball is lifted, that player, you know, the rock or mall is then over. So that player, as long as he was legally where he was, he can then essentially tackle the nine. Now, I think that is where this could be cleared up. And if that is what the law trial was, um, so essentially, if you're in the rock or the mall, you're not then able to tackle the uh, the person that picks the ball up, then I'll be happy to see that. If it's anything more complex than that or more in detail, then maybe not. The next one, actually, this could be the most most complex, depending on how they word it. And it is play on for line out, not straight, if the throw in is un uncontested. Now, this opens up a whole can of worms, I think. On the face of it, I agree with the law. It sounds like a decent option, but I think it needs to be worded really carefully because, you know, what's to stop a team throwing directly to their own scrum half, for example, if they know the opposition isn't going to get up and challenge? Is that still OK? Does it have to be a genuine throw? You know, does it have to genuinely have been attempted to have been thrown straight? And if that is the case, how do you judge that? Um, and yeah, there's there's lots that go on here. And then also, what deems the line out to have been contested? Is it just one player anywhere in the line out getting off the ground, or is it somewhere within two meters of the of the receiver? You know, there's lots of questions about this. It does seem it does seem like a good idea, but I just think there's so many complex um, things that could come out of it that it might open up a can of worms that would be very difficult to. To, to reorder. So I'd love to hear your comments on that one in particular. Um, but I'm sure there are coaches out there at the moment, line out coaches who are going through all kinds of scenarios, trying to figure out exactly what's going to go on. Okay, so that's the third phase. Uh, closed law trials, which will be coming up uh, soon, I believe. The fourth phase is specialist working groups. And uh, I'll rattle through these quickly. So there's on and off field sanctions. So they're looking at the disciplinary process to improve streamlining and, and making it easier for fans to understand. They're also looking at a global red card trial where a, uh, where a player who's committed foul play is removed uh, for, the, the, for the rest of the game. But after 20 minutes, another player can come on. So I guess this is looking to soften slightly in terms of the game itself, the effect of all these red cards we're seeing for headshots. However, the player, player themselves will still get fined and banned and all that stuff, but their team won't be as, as affected. Um, the next one is tackle rope breakdown. And this is a major review of safety and spectacle issues as they relate to the breakdown, e.g. the impact of contesting the ball on the floor, the jackal, as opposed to an upright driving game. So this sounds like they might be looking at potentially going back to more of a, an old-fashioned rocking scenario where, uh, where shoulders are not allowed to go below the hips, which is as the law is currently written, but not enforced. Television match official protocol. And I think this is really right for tightening up and making sure that everybody's on the same page with this, because we see so many different things from week to week, from game to game. Some TMOs come, with, come in for some things, some come in for others. And it's a bit of a mess at the moment. So they're looking to sort out that protocol, which I think should be really tightened down to just some very small specific things. Uh, I think we see too much TMO at the moment and we could do with getting less of that. And also, while setting new minimum standards for technology providers, again, a bit woolly, um, but we'll have to see. It sounds like a good idea um, so that everybody, again, can um, fulfil these new protocols when they're written. They're looking at the replacements. So this is examining the latest research on the impact of fatigue and the number of timing of replacements in the elite game to determine options that might create more space on the field while improving injury rates. Again, this is one of those that is really complex and it's the obvious answers aren't always the correct answer. 
the uh, Science of Sport podcast went into this in some detail in, a, in an episode last year, I think it was. And essentially, it's very difficult to pass out all of that data and find out exactly what the effects are um, in terms of the injury, certainly. So this will be a very interesting one in terms of how much effort they put into this, how much data. I think this will be a long term project. Uh, and they're looking at the fan experience. So this is all about media marketing and, and trying to get into new modern audiences uh, to, to build rugby's attention. Lastly, they're also looking at the tackle height to consider the results of the community tackle height trials across 11 unions and then consider the appropriateness for elite rugby as a result of that. So, I mean, that initial absolute mess that they created with the implementation of these tackle height changes in the community game in England, uh, I mean, it's gone very quiet now. I think almost nobody that I've spoken to has got any issue with them whatsoever. It, the game's barely changed from what I can understand. It really hasn't made a huge amount of difference. So it'll be interesting to see whether that then comes up to elite rugby as well. And the fifth and last phase is rugby labs, which sounds very scientific and it sounds like they're going to be testing out new aspects of law in a controlled environment, evaluated by data and player feedback. I mean, how accurate that will be to actually the game will be very interesting obviously these are going to be very uh highly specialized sort of scientists i guess that are going to be running these trials and these labs so it'll be very interesting to see what kind of things they're going to be testing and again i think it's very much safety and making the game flow better and be a better product at the end so there we go the final three phases, what do you think? Do you agree with Rob Baxter? Basically leave the game alone, let it settle, let people understand what it's all about and really get into a groove with it. It'll evolve naturally anyway. Fix the things that need fixing, but stop meddling too much. You know, that's kind of that's kind of where I lie at the little bit. Um, or are you just open to anything that improves the game? You know, open to, you know, whatever it is. Uh, to make it a better product, a safer product, but still keep everything that makes rugby rugby. Let me know in the comments down below and I will join you there for a conversation. Give this video a thumbs up if you don't mind while you're down there and you can subscribe there. You can watch that one next. And do not forget to get out and play.